said, my name is Jan van Nefkamen. I'm the founder and CEO of Ancient History Encyclopedia. And I'm James Blake Diener, and I live in Zurich, and I'm the co-founder and communications director of Ancient History Encyclopedia, and we're thrilled to be here. Thank you for coming. So tonight's presentation is going to be in several parts. Um, first, I'm going to talk about who we are, um, what we do, uh, how we see history and its importance and our approach to it. Um, we're going to talk very shortly, briefly, because I think that's not the greatest interest here, about um, how we run our operation. And, uh, and then uh, James, who is really our Middle East expert here, uh, I'm more on the business and tech side. Um, James will be speaking about um, cultural heritage in the Middle East and uh, how essentially digital tools can um, be used to help with exactly the things that you just mentioned, cultural dialogue and um, basically opening up the world and the minds of the people with the help of history. And then we're going to finish by quickly looking at um, the future of uh, what we focus on in terms of helping with that mission. And after that, we're very open for questions. Um, yeah. So, quickly about Ancient History Encyclopedia. Ancient History Encyclopedia is a non-profit company that uh, is registered in the United Kingdom. Um, our mission is to engage people with cultural heritage and improve history education worldwide. Um, we do this primarily through online means. We operate the most read history encyclopedia um, in the world, online or offline. And um, uh, that makes us one of the uh, largest uh, online history websites in the world as well, at least in the English language. Now, um, why do we do this? Why we think this is important? Um, well, first of all, it's, it's about identities, national identities and cultural identities, because history is the foundation upon which we build our national identities, and, and the interpretation of the past of a nation is generally what is used to create such an identity. And I think the word interpretation here is very important, because uh, different nations have different interpretations of the same events, and that changes how they take these events to create their national identity. And um, of course, there's also the greater picture, there's the cultural identity, whether it's European culture, Middle Eastern culture, um, all of this is built on traditions and uh, in the long term on history. So, um, at the same time, a lack of understanding of the history is a, a sure path, not a sure path, but it certainly helps with uh, xenophobia. So uh, the more the other that you look at is the unknown, the, the less you know about where they're coming from, what their perspective is, and maybe what their history is, the less you will be able to understand them, and the more easily you will be afraid of them. Uh, Peter Furtado, um, he's a historian, he wrote a really good book called Histories of Nations. And I'm just going to quote here. He said, if we fail to understand how others think and feel about their past, we will fail to understand them. And that's really at the heart of uh, why we're doing what we're doing, because we want to make sure that um, with more people understanding history, we help to create a more open-minded world that focuses less on nationalism and xenophobia and um, basically helps people understand all these informations that we get nowadays about what's happening in different parts of the world to understand how they connect and how did that come to be because um, I feel that we need to understand the past to make sense of the present to create a better future and um, that's kind of where we come from especially in the modern media with a lot of fake news being uh, thrown around, we feel that the understanding of history is increasingly important. Now one thing that, one line that we like to use to say is, history grows the mind, because understanding history helps us understand ourselves, it helps us understand others, it helps us complex, uh, understand the complex connections between things that exist in the world today, that have existed in the past, and that may exist in the future. History also opens the mind, it opens you to, to other cultures, it opens people to um, wanting to learn more, to approach other people, um, again, by understanding where they're coming from, it's a lot easier to 
talk to them, to approach them, and not to be feel threatened. So now I'm going to talk very shortly about us, about ancient history and encyclopedia. So uh, we were founded in 2009 as a small website. Um, it was kind of really a little hobby project of mine. I got a few writers involved. I, I paid them to uh, contribute the first uh, 100 articles. And um, some of them stayed on. And uh, we basically got volunteers on board, James being one of the very early ones as well. Um, until in 2012, we uh, incorporated as a non-profit company because <coughs> we realized that what we were publishing on our website, mainly articles and images, um, was something that people really wanted to read. There was a lot of a large audience. We received uh, emails from people all over the world who were telling us that what we were doing was extremely helpful to them. I remember very clearly there was a, a person from India who emailed us and said, um, "You guys just." completely changed my mind about what we learn in, in history at school here in India. I understood that everything they teach us here um, is false. And uh, so, uh, you know, I read your articles and then I saw your bibliography and I was like, that must be true. So then I bought some of the books in your bibliography and I really understood that, you know, they're teaching us propaganda. Um, and so this is kind of the, the sort of email that makes us really feel that we're doing the right thing. <coughs> So as I said, we, we're mostly run by volunteers. We currently have about 12 people on the team. Um, out of them, three are employed, the rest are volunteers. And uh, we have a large number of contributors who write for us from all over the world. Um, the, uh, some of them are historians or archaeologists. Some of them are simply um, historical writers. Or we have some people who uh, simply are quite knowledgeable about uh, the uh, subject. Mm -hmm. For example, we have um, a neurologist who lives in Iraq, who uh, travels to the various sites in Iraq that, well, nowadays none of us can access, um, and he photographs them and he um, writes about, uh, essentially, his experience of accessing these sites. He has friends there who run uh, the museum, the local museum, and he basically gets them to give him the information and access to his, their archives. And so um, that, that, for example, is somebody in the Middle East who um, I think does a great service to essentially promoting the history of this country to people who cannot possibly visit it right now all over the world. So um, until now we've published around 2,100 articles on our website, um, primarily about ancient history. We've just started on medieval history as well. We cover history all over the world. Um, not just uh, European or Mediterranean, but also um, in East Asia and the Americas. Um, still a little bit short on Africa, but we're going to get there at some point. Um, we have a large media library, um, over 8,000 items in there, uh, mostly images, videos, and also some 3D models that you can just watch on our website from uh, various angles. So we have, for example, some reconstructions of destroyed temples in Palmyra there, or um, the uh, you know, 3D models of the pyramids, or various temples, those kind of things. And as I said, people from all over the world have contributed to our website. I think currently we've had over 200 people write for us. Um, all of this is unpaid, because we're a non-profit. So uh, that's kind of how we operate. We also have a very large social media presence, with around 700,000 people following us on social media. and. Um, I think that's mainly because we want to make sure that everything is actually interesting to people. We're not like a dry encyclopedia. The, the word in our name might bring these boring memories uh, back from uh, printed times, but uh, we really make sure that our articles are interesting to read. And um, I said we are one of the most read history publications in the world, so we have around 20, almost 20 million people who read our website every year. Um, and uh, uh, that is more, for example, than the British Museum and the Louvre's website combined, just to give a perspective. So how, how do we do this and what's our approach um, to running this operation? So when I started this website, um, the idea was really that history is a web, that it's connected. And it, it really came for me from my background of going to school and learning about history. And uh, at some point I understood that um, the way history is taught in, in most countries at least, um, certainly was for me, um, this idea of a national history. So if you're German and you go to school in Germany, you learn the history of Germany. And 
when you're English, you know, you learn the history of England. Um, and uh, it, it isn't actually just the history of England because it's all connected. You cannot look at history in isolation. You have to look at history from the different perspectives and the interrelations between countries and cultures. And without that, uh, it, I think you have a warped sense of, of identity. Um, uh, one of the members on our board of advisors, she is um, an advisor on the um, British curriculum uh, development, and uh, she essentially uh, lamented that in many schools in Britain, um, history starts with William the Conqueror. Um, before that, nothing gets taught. So obviously, you're missing out on uh, you know you're missing out on the Roman invasions, you're missing out on the Viking invasions, you're missing out on the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and if you think that history starts with Roman the Con uh, William the Conqueror, then your sense of self-identity of what is it to be British is quite different than if you t if you know about all of these other peoples that have congregated in this country over the centuries. Um, to essentially build this country of what it is right now, and also the English language, of course. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of our background. We want to make sure that uh, everything we do is interconnected, and the entire website is built on this principle that everything is interconnected. So um, we don't use an off-the-shelf off publishing solution like WordPress. Um, we have a custom-built website, and um, a lot of it is automated which helps us run this large operation with only um, three editors um, because everything automatically gets interlinked with those things that are related to it. So when you read an article on, I don't know, Alexander the Great, you will instantly encounter Darius and Xerxes and have all of those related things showing up around and leading you to the next thing to follow that web. Um, and unlike Wikipedia, where everything has to be done manually with a link, um, as I said, for us, that just happens on the website. Um, so yeah, we have a very small team running um, the editorial process, and the editorial process is actually really important to us, because again, unlike Wikipedia, every submission to our website is actually checked by our editorial team. Um, they review everything that comes in, they check whether it is accurate or not, uh, you wouldn't believe the kind of things we receive about aliens and strange alignments <laughs> and <it's animals. laughs> uh, all of those things. So, um, so yeah, we make sure that everything is accurate. But almost more importantly, we make sure that everything that is published is well written, that it is interesting and coherent, um, so that uh, the general public um, and primarily also students around the world um, will not get bored by it, will find it interesting. We try to highlight the stories of history. I like to say story is actually the key part of the word history. Um, so yeah. Um, and as a result of this process and the way we present things, uh, I think we are one of the most trusted resources um, online. Uh, we've been recommended by various universities, including Oxford University, um, the European Commission's Open Education Europa, um, the School Library Journal in the United States has recommended us. So uh, the, the list is longer, I don't want to bore you with that. Um, but uh, thousands of schools all around the world use our website, um, and that is for multiple reasons. First of all, uh, we found that a lot of teachers themselves are actually not experts in any particular field of history, and they're, but they are expected to teach fields that they have no expertise on. So they actually come to our website when um, they have to teach ancient history and they learn about it themselves. Um, something I'm going to come back to later. The other thing is that, of course, students uh, often get um, an assignment, they Google it. <laughs> you know, when were the pyramids built? Kind of thing. Why? Um, <laughs> And, um, and find us. And a lot of teachers also send their students to our website in uh, their reading lists or assignments. Um, we ran uh, several sort of surveys of our readers and we found that out of the students, 84% reported that, um, that they felt that their academic performance uh, was improved from our website. We've received many emails of students saying, you saved my life, I've got to be on my essay. Um, that kind of thing. So uh, that, of course, is one of the things that we do, one of the pillars of what we focus on, education. Another pillar that we focus on is generally public awareness. Um, so 
we want to make sure that people, not just in education, but people in general, have a better understanding of history. We want to make it easy for them to learn about it, um, to find us, and to find the information that they need. Um, we do that, obviously, also through our social media channels. Um, as I said, we have hundreds of thousands of people who follow us who just want to learn about history because they're interested. And about 80% of the people that read our website said that we've stimulated them to learn more, which makes us very happy. And then a third pillar is kind of travel. A lot of the people who visit our website, um, they actually use it uh, to replace their travel guide. So they uh, research the sites that they want to visit ahead of time. Travel guides nowadays are getting cut down more and more. Um, there isn't the same amount of information in there that there used to be 20 years ago. So um, people are basically complementing that online. Uh, we've, uh, we have a good partnership with a travel magazine called Timeless Travels. They do everything about history and travel. Great magazine, I recommend it. Um, it's published by a former archaeologist. And um, so uh, we also publish a lot of travel-centric um, things all around history on our website. So then how do we run all of this? Very quickly. Um, primarily advertising on our website. Uh, unfortunately, it's a necessary evil. Um, we need to run that. We need money to buy the books, to uh, pay the team uh, members who are paid. Most of them are not yet. <laughs> um, in order to be able to actually write more um, than we used to when we were all volunteers. Um, we've gotten quite good at online advertising over the years. But, um, yeah. Then there's membership. So uh, people who like our website, they can support us with a monthly donation. Um, and in return, we take the ads away. That's really helping us over the summer months when school's out. None of those students visit our website. Um, our traffic goes down quite a lot. Uh, so that's, that's really useful and very helpful. And that keeps growing very steadily. We've also received um, several grants from organizations that represent um, what, nations. So uh, Armenia, Japan, and Korea have basically given us money to write about their histories and produce educational materials for teachers so that they can more easily teach that history because it's often overlooked in Western schools. We've also worked with uh, companies um, to sponsor some of our content. Um, so here, uh, the company that we've done this most with is Creative Assembly. It's a games company. They publish historical computer games, um, many of which are uh, set in an ancient setting. And so they've sponsored us to write about subjects that are related to their games and um, to have a little sponsorship banner on the article. But obviously, primarily, that's a really good thing for us and good publicity for them. So now I'm going to hand over to James. Mm -hmm. James is really our Middle East expert here uh, with a lengthy background, which maybe you can talk a bit more about. Yes, um, hello again, I'm James Blakebeiner. I studied uh, history and Middle Eastern Islamic studies at New York University. I received my BA and my MA in history and Middle Eastern Islamic studies. And I had been teaching, I was a professor, actually when I came across Ancient History Encyclopedia and Jan reached out to me and I loved what you were doing. I think it's absolutely fantastic. And the rest is what we call Ancient History now, because <laughs> it's been seven years. Um, and I want to begin, actually, sure. you know, yeah, 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 we should probably move that just over. over just slightly yeah. so I can Without unplugging it. Right, reach it. I'm sorry to introduce my mini lecture <coughs> with some very sad images, but what I want to do, at least in my portion of the talk tonight, is for us to begin thinking about cultural heritage in a broader term, how it applies to the Middle East how people in the Middle East can valorize their cultural heritage and how we can help them do that as well. And also some opportunities. I don't want my talk to be completely <laughs> pessimistic and I promise that it won't be. But it's been a very difficult decade in the Middle East when it comes to cultural heritage. And I selected these photos simply because I think in the West we often hear news about the destruction of cultural heritage, but in the news media they like to discuss classical works of antiquity, grand monuments from ancient Babylon, and so forth, Samaria, um, looting in Egypt. But we often forget what's happening on the ground, also what other types of structures, edifices, um, environments, and artifacts are destroyed. And here's a picture, actually this is the destruction of the boy 
of a Sufi shrine in Libya as a result of the civil war there from 2014. And you can also see on your right hand side the destruction of another Sufi shrine and mosque in Yemen as a result of the ongoing conflict in Yemen, which is absolutely heartbreaking. Yemen certainly does not receive the media coverage it deserves, um, in my opinion. But not only Sufi communities and um, structures are destroyed, this is, of course, in Iraq, this is in Mosul, and this is a Shia mosque and shrine. And then finally, of course, in Syria, the destruction of um, this actually is another Sufi uh, mosque and shrine from the 13th century. So while it has been certainly a rough and tumultuous decade, I think we all need to expand our definition of cultural heritage. And it's worth remembering that cultural heritage encompasses a lot of different things. It's not just old buildings and old ruins. Um, of course, built environments, so buildings, landscapes, archaeological remains, mosques, of course, grand sites like Palmyra and Hatra are very important in Caravanserai, too. But it also includes natural environments. Um, probably some of you have been to Wadi Rum in Jordan um, or Golistan National Park in Iran. Um, I think the irrigation systems as well in Oman, which are ancient. Um, and these can be regarded as cultural heritage and cultural patrimony, too. And of course, artifacts as well. I mean, Islamic art is spectacular. It's what attracted me to the field, to Near Eastern studies. I think the Blue Mosque, or excuse me, the Blue uh, Quran from North Africa, from Tunisia. I think of the stories of the Shahnameh from Iran. I think of Iznik pottery from the Ottoman Empire. And I think of other things too. I was actually in Armenia for ancient history and encyclopedia. I was in the Caucasus, and I learned about the various textiles that were produced in the region. And I learned about Khaitag from Dagestan, which are absolutely beautiful as well. So we can define cultural heritage as an expression, an expression of the ways of living passed on from generation to generation. And we can distinguish cultural heritage by its tangibility or intangibility. And I can define this a little bit more. I know people struggle with the definition of tangible versus intangible. But tangible cultural heritage just refers to physical artifacts that are produced or maintained or transmitted intergenerationally from generation to generation within a society over time. Whereas intangible heritage are things like oral traditions, uh, mythology, performing arts, local knowledge, and traditional skills. So I think automatically of the beautiful textiles from <coughs> Palestine, in particular, and folk clothing. So as I said, I, want, I think it's important for us to extend our definition, um, simply because cultural heritage at its core it resonates with human creation and with the intention to inform. When I think of the Middle East, I think uh, the Middle East is the birthplace of diplomacy. Um, you all must know about the Amarna letters from ancient Egypt. I hope you all do. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um, well, I hope there aren't any sinologists here, because there are some historians from China that would disagree with me, but many historians regard the Amarna letters as the first written documents attesting to uh, diplo diplomacy between the states of the Near East, so Babylon, Mitanni, um, and also the Hittite Empire in ancient Egypt. Of course, everybody wanted to go to Egypt because Egypt had gold. Mm -hmm. um, but also, the first peace treaty comes from the Middle East. I loved when I taught, uh, surprising my students with this fact. Does anybody know when the first peace treaty was? At least if you're of a Middle Eastern orientation after the Battle of Kadesh between ancient Egypt and the Hittite Empire. So the Middle East has a long legacy of cultural diplomacy and diplomacy in the political sense, too. And cultural diplomacy is nothing new. It's existed as a practice over the centuries. I think of Arab hospitality. I'm an Arabist by background and training, so excuse me if we have any Persians here. I think of Arab hospitality as a great expression of cultural diplomacy. Um, but again, this is nothing new. It's not a phenomenon of the digital age. Any person can practice this. 
And any person who interacts with different cultures facilitates a form and expression of cultural exchange. And of course, this can take place in a variety of different environments and settings. And I like to think of ourselves at Ancient History Encyclopedia as cultural ambassadors or cultural diplomats, and of course, all of you as well, when you share your knowledge with other people too. And as I said, the Middle East has a very special role and special place in this history. Uh, of course, the establishment of regular trade routes that crisscross the Middle East enabled frequent exchanges of information, whether through cultural gifts or artistic expressions, between traders, artists, government representatives, and ordinary people. The Middle East is the nexus of interaction between Europe and Africa and also Asia, Southeast Asia and East Asia. We live in a world that's increasingly globalized and interdependent, and there's a proliferation of mass communication. Um, technology is influencing and affecting our lives now more than, than ever, and it's certainly affecting the Middle East too, and we believe I personally believe, too, that cultural diplomacy is critical to fostering peace and stability, not only in the Middle East, but everywhere in the world. And it's a powerful tool in not only education, but in winning hearts and minds, in combating extremism in all of its various forms. I wanted to talk to just bring up a few issues I see when I work with people in the Middle East, in the cultural heritage sector or the cultural resource management sector. Um, I talk with people across the, the Arab world, but also people in Turkey, Egypt, and Pakistan. Um, and these are some things we discuss at length. And if you have any solutions to these problems, we can talk about them. I'm very, very interested hearing your thoughts. Um, but internet inf infrastructure remains a key problem in the Middle East. Um, as many of you know, when you go to a city like Abu Dhabi in Dubai, the internet is absolutely fantastic and it runs as it would in London or in Zurich or in New York City. Um, but elsewhere in the Middle East it can be very slow, it can be very spotty, and this hinders uh, the use of electronic tools and digital tools in safeguarding and also capturing um, cultural heritage, whether in photographic form, making videos and so forth, uploading them online. It becomes very, very difficult. And I just wanted to point out the statistic. In the UAE, 84% of people have access to broadband, so fast internet. While in Iraq, it's only 17%. And it actually might be less now in Iraq, given the recent turmoil caused by ISIS. Another major issue in valorizing um, cultural heritage in the region is censorship. Um, I know people in working as professors and researchers in the Middle East. This is something they come across fairly often, um, but it varies from country to country. I will say, though, I can't imagine teaching a lecture on Renaissance art, in particular Botticelli's art, um, without being able to show the birth of Venus, for example. Um, these are situations and instances <laughs> that occur very frequently in institutions. Um, but again, it varies from region to region. Some of you may know that um, okay. in Turkey now, Twitter is banned. This is something Erdogan has done too. And this also hinders um, the facilitation of sharing, sharing not only information, um, but sharing as well thoughts and sharing um, updated pieces of uh, cultural heritage, uh, the state of how cultural heritage looks. Um, and also, obviously, insecurity too. We see reprisals against archaeologists, people who work out in the field with alarming regularity. And actually, you had a story. Yeah. Um, well, so, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's this um, neurologist in Iraq uh, who often works for us. Um, and he's quite well-connected man, right? He, um, he's uh, good friends with like, the uh, <coughs> head of uh, the museum in Suleymaniye city in Iraqi Kurdistan. He's very well-connected. And uh, he visits these sites and writes about them and publishes on our website. 
but um, he's had um, threats made against him for doing so um, from people for various reasons. Some people simply do not understand why he would publish this on a, a Western website, um, that he's basically sharing their culture with the West and like giving it away. Um, he's had issues where um, a photo that he had uploaded to our website was used by a London-based publisher as a cover for a book, and that book had nothing to do with the Middle East, but that London-based publisher had in the past published um, manifestos for an organization that in the Middle East is considered a um, terrorist organization. And so um, he got involved with us to uh, use all our legal force to get that publisher to remove this picture from the head of uh, the, uh, the, the cover of the book. Um, because he was afraid that uh, this might reflect badly on him and cause him personal problems. And um, there were also uh, cases where um, people from the museum didn't talk to him anymore because he's, he had written something uh, on uh, our website that they disapproved of. And um, it's not quite clear what happened and why, but you know, he, um, he was shot at in his car. Um, and he thought it was related to his activities at Ancient History Encyclopedia, and for that reason he stopped writing for us for six months, just to let things calm down. So I think that, that really shocked me, and I, I think that's, um, that is a big issue um, for people in the Middle East who want to share their culture. The, the cultures of sharing isn't there. Um, there was a question earlier about archives, and um, we know from uh, our connections there that getting access to imagery from a museum or a cultural institution is just nearly impossible. The, the idea of giving that, giving that away, so to say, um, is, is, is seen as negative. They want to keep it for themselves. Um, yeah, and I, I really feel as though these archaeologists are true heroes, these people who risk these men and women who go out into the field and work, especially in dangerous conditions. Um, but unfortunately for us, it also, unfortunately, comes with a price. Yeah. Many people are injured or killed or kidnapped. And this is very problematic and unfortunately it discourages more work from being done. I think we have to be careful though to say this is not the Middle East. Right. right. It's a very large region with many different countries and different mm -hmm. situations. But in some countries, in some parts of some countries, this is a real problem. I also wanted us to take a look east too. Um, the world is changing, and there is a sea of tremendous opportunity. Um, India, by the year 2050, is expected to have the world's largest Muslim population, with about 311 million people. This is larger than, well, it's almost as large as the present population of the United States. Um, currently, Indonesia is the world's largest Islamic country, and its population is also expected to grow tremendously as is that of Nigeria, which by 2050 should have the fourth largest Muslim population in the world at the time. So when I speak to people in the Middle East, I'm hearing a lot of interest in working with people in Asia, um, not just in Southeast Asia, in India or in Asia, but also in East Asia, of course, because of the new technologies emerging from China, Japan, and Korea. And I thought this, um, this map showing the explosion of population in Africa and also in Southeast Asia is very telling. Um, in the West, we hear about how tremendous demographic changes in Africa and in Asia are going to affect ourselves. It's also definitely going to affect the Middle East. Um, and there are going to be tremendous challenges, but also tremendous opportunities for people to work together and share Middle Eastern cultures and heritage and art. And I wanted to show this slide too. I was just at an event at the Asia Society in Zurich and they allowed me to use these slides. Some of you probably have heard of China's new initiative, the um, Belt and Road Initiative, which is somewhat controversial depending on your perspective. Um, but China is building roads and tremendous infrastructure in the region. And I suspect they shall continue to do so and also build in the Middle East proper as well within the next couple of decades. Uh, they're building a port in Djibouti, and they're also building a huge port in Pakistan too. 
And also just wanted to show trade flow within Asia. Um, Indonesia is becoming a middle class society nation. Um, people have disposable incomes, people are interested in culture, they're interested in the arts, and they're willing to patronize uh, museums and exhibitions. And I think a lot of people in the Middle East, I'm hoping, this is my hope, will be cognizant of these developments and seize the day and send their art to the various parts of the world, not just to the West, but also to Asia as well. And so now we return back to Jan. Yeah, so the future is grand term. <laughs> I'm really talking about um, what we want to do in the future. James already alluded to the future from a more geopolitical perspective. Um, well, kind of to summarize this whole thing so far, um, I think what, what we feel very strongly is that we are all cultural diplomats. And um, ruins, they, they don't speak for themselves. We need to give them a voice. And uh, that's what we do. And that's what we hope people in the Middle East will do increasingly. Um, our neurologist is a, a very laudable <laughs> example, but he is one man. Um, many other people could do this. Many people are deterred by the um, challenges they face that we've um, explained, and we hope that it will um, improve for the better. Until then, um, yes, digital tools are the way that we can reach people and that the Middle East can reach the West and Asia because uh, many Middle Eastern countries nowadays are not very accessible um, from a security standpoint. And uh, many people around the world simply do not have the means to travel um, to the Middle East. And uh, I'm particularly thinking here about, uh, for example, the United States. Uh, it's a large country uh, with immense influence in the world, uh, rising xenophobia, as we all know. And, um, and you know, many of the people who live there will have, in their entire lifetime, never left the United States. Therefore, will not have encountered other cultures, particularly not the Middle East. Um, it's probably not the first destination for most Americans. Um, but there's, a, I think, a certain undercurrent of Islamophobia in the United States. Um, and we think that by exposing people more to the heritage of um, the Middle East, the traditions of where they're coming from, um, and, and basically what is driving that part of the world, um, is really important. And so, uh, yeah, we, we want to focus on that more in the future, and we hope others will do too. Um, one thing that we are uh, doing is uh, we've partnered up with um, Time Passport, the Canadian uh, company that uh, works on augmented reality, or AR. Um, we have a little flyer here. Uh, on the back is uh, Time Passport's um, app. It's currently free to download. And uh, you can see a little screenshot here. It, um, it's a, essentially a demo app, a prototype. Um, and uh, what you can do is, in your phone, when you hold up your phone, you can see the seven wonders of the world um, on your table, um, for example, and look at it from all angles. But what you can also do is you can go outside on the field and you can then um, see the hanging gardens of Babylon in front of you and walk around them. And um, that's, as I said, it's a prototype. What we want to do with them um, is essentially work to uh, create learning experiences um, that incorporate AR, for example, for sites, heritage sites that are partially destroyed. So imagine you stand in front of a ruin and then you hold up your phone and you can see what it used to look like if you were there. Or if you can't travel there, you can put it on your table and look at it from all different angles. So you can go out to the schoolyard with a class and look at it to have a much better sense of what this site is and um, improve the learning experience uh, that you know you simply wouldn't have if you just read a text about um, this ancient site or medieval site that may no longer exist or may be in ruins. And uh, all of that obviously is combined with um, teaching materials, explanatory articles from ancient history encyclopedia, not just about the uh, site itself, but the things around it. So let's say we have a castle that we want to look at, and you can then learn about you know, daily life in a castle, castle architecture, feudalism, all of those things. Um, and all of this is uh, part of an education platform that we're building. Uh, we've uh, interviewed a large number of teachers um, who visit our site, um, and we want to help teachers because 
we think that cultural diplomacy starts in school. Um, it is in school that most people get exposed to history. Many people forget about it afterwards, go uh, about their daily lives unless they are interested like we are. Um, but um, if we manage to teach people in school better about other cultures, about their histories, then we have build, built the basis for building a more open-minded and um, welcoming society that, uh, like James said, it, it, it uh, warms hearts. <laughs> um, so we are basically building these tools for teachers to make it easier for them to give engaging lessons to students um, about subjects that otherwise might be ignored, um, such as um, you know, ancient history in the Middle East, which, for example, in this country is barely taught, um, and in many countries around the world, let's, realize, let's not say it's all the UK's fault. <laughs> um, so, uh, essentially, that's where we want to go. Um, we also, of course, want to continue our um, encyclopedia. Uh, we are continuing outside of the ancient world uh, with medieval subjects right now. Um, We'll continue with the ancient world as well, we're not done yet, and um, we're probably going to rebrand to World History Encyclopedia reasonably soon. So that's where we are. We hope there will be other initiatives like ours, hopefully coming up in the Middle East, um, despite the challenges. And um, yeah, so that's it. Uh, we're open for questions and uh, comments. <laughs>